Hi everyone, here we are with microbial control. We're in section 9.2 and we're going to look at methods of physical control. And I'm relatively new to this book, but I can't find in this chapter where they talk about soap. So I'm going to talk about soap right here. As we all know, soap is a really important um, tool for microbial control. And um, most of us are commonly wash our hands multiple times a day. And if you work in a healthcare setting, you might wash your hands 10 times a day or more. So um, it's definitely important. And the main way that soap helps us control microbes is that it acts as um, for sanitization or de-germing. I usually use the word de-germing when I um, talk about soap. And what that means is you're actually going to break up the oils on your skin or on the surface and then you're going to rinse them off. So I have that included under physical methods of control because it really is more of a, you know, breaking up the oils and rinsing it off is more of a mechanical or physical thing. Um, soap itself is not antimicrobial. Soap doesn't kill bacteria. It, it is really just the physical removal of bacteria from your skin that makes soap effective. So remember that one of the things that we want to resist at this point is thinking that we have to remove all microbes from everything. And um, there's no reason we need to sterilize our hands or use something more vigorous. The There are soaps that have antimicrobial agents added to them. You might hear them called uh, antimicrobial soaps or germicidal soaps. But um, the main category of those that we had used for many years is actually taken off the market because um, we realized we didn't need that antimicrobial in our soaps and it might have been doing more harm than good. So soaps themselves are good degermers. They break up oils. They allow us to rinse microbes off their, our hands. But soap doesn't clean um, necessarily kill microbes directly. Um, the second one, the second learning outcome I have on section 9.2 is discuss moist and dry heat methods. And so let's talk about heat because heat really is one of the main things that we use to control microbial growth. You're, we're all familiar with using heat at home and um, and cooking foods because you know we think oh it's not going to be healthy unless I I cook it before I eat it. So here it says um, elevated temperatures are microbicidal, microbicidal, and lower temperatures are microbostatic. So um, higher temperatures will kill kill microorganisms, whereas lower temperatures will just stop their growth. And when we're using heat to kill microorganisms, um, we generally pick either we'll pick either moist heat or dry heat and so moist heat is going to be things like hot water or boiling or steam and we'll I'll give you some examples another example of that and um, dry heat would be things like using an open flame or the oven the main thing to distinguish between moist heat and dry heat is moist heat penetrates well um, you might have put something in the oven maybe some cookies and open the oven and been able to kind of check on the cookies. But if you put something in the oven that's very moist, like a turkey, and then you open the oven and all that steam hits you, you go, whoa, and it's very easy to get burned on that. So the moist heat is much more penetrating and therefore more effective than the dry heat. The main thing that heat is going to do, and, and most of the time we're going to be using moist heat, um, is to denature proteins. We've talked about how high temperature can denature proteins. So that's going to be um, a very effective way at, at inactivating microorganisms. But um, the other thing that heat can do, particularly dry heat like a flame, is just incinerate things, just to burn it up and turn it into you know, dust. So um, nothing can survive being completely burned up. Here's a table that's just giving a comparison of moist heat and dry heat. And it's picking 121 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature of our of an autoclave, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so 100 degrees is boiling. So 121 degrees Celsius is above boiling. And um, the that moist heat temperature will effectively kill endospores, inactivate endospores in 15 minutes and therefore sterilize. If I have dry heat like an oven, um, here I have, it takes like 600 minutes, so it takes substantially longer for dry heat to inactivate and sterilize than it takes for moist heat. 
here it's talking about some details on um, changing proteins. But the main way that heat's going to affect proteins is going to denature the proteins. I'm going to skip all that stuff. Here we go. Remember, here it says again, just to remind you, those agents that are capable of sterilizing will be kind of this pinkish background. Okay, so here's kind of a rundown of the ways that we use heat to to control microorganisms. Um, boiling water is very effective at disinfecting. Remember, disinfecting is inactivating vegetative pathogens, not necessarily endospores. And um, water only gets up to 100 degrees Celsius, no matter how long you boil it. So it will not necessarily kill um, all resistant cells. There are some thermophiles that can survive that. And there's also, remember, the endospores. So boiling water is a great way to reduce the number of microorganisms, but um, it's not a reliable way to sterilize. Pasteurization, we've all heard of pasteurized milk. And notice that the pasteurization is not pink background, meaning it doesn't sterilize. But pasteurization was named after Louis Pasteur in um, the 1800s, and he actually did invent this technique. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to reduce the number of microorganisms in um, a liquid. In this case, he was trying to make, use grape juice to make wine. And um, they, he was trying to reduce the number of microorganisms without damaging the food itself. So pasteurization is a, a, me a mechanism that's used for foods, particularly beverages. And so the idea is, is you heat up the, the food, and we know we do a lot of milk pasteurization. So the, the milk is heated up to a temperature at which most of the vegetative or most of the potential pathogenic vegetative pathogens um, will die. And so it says um, the, there's a lot of microorganisms in there, that, in there that could spoil the food or cause diseases. And so you heat, it, you heat the food up enough to kill these common microorganisms, the ones that can cause disease, the ones that cause food spoilage, but not so hot that you ruin the um, consistency of the food. So you all know if you boil milk, it gets kind of lumpy and we don't want to drink lumpy milk. So we're going to pasteurize it instead of boil it. Um, ordinary pasteurization heats the liquid to 71 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds or 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. So somewhere in that hot range, but not boiling. And um, like I said, that's going to preserve the quality of the food and without um, while killing um, organisms. So it doesn't sterilize. And um, it's, but here it says 97 to 99% of bacteria and fungi are inactivated, but it doesn't kill endospores. And um, that means if you take your milk that's pasteurized and you leave it in the refrigerator and you never open it, it's still going to eventually spoil because there are microorganisms there. So pasteurization, again, is a way to heat a liquid enough to kill the common pathogen and pathogens and spoilage microbes without damaging the liquid itself. The next mechanism for using moist heat for controlling microorganisms is something called autoclaving. And this is steam under pressure. And if you look down here, there's a um, showing you this little chamber where they're putting something in there. And it, this is like a, um, a pressure cooker. And here's a, a bigger one. This is, would be like one that would be standing in a room. In our microbiology lab at Corning Community College, we have one that's just like this. And so it's kind of built into a wall and it has a boiler down at the bottom. And that boiler is going to create some steam. And you're going to be able to put your um, objects in here close the door and let the steam come into here. And because this is made of this really heavy steel, um, you can actually get the pressure up higher than atmospheric pressure in this autoclave. And so the idea is that um, if you can get the, the pressure up above atmospheric pressure, you can get the temperature above 
boiling. So no matter how long, like we said up here, no matter how long I boil my water, it's going to stay at 100 degrees Celsius. If I can take that boiling water and put it under pressure in the autoclave or like you do in a pressure cooker at home, I can actually get the temperature up to 121 degrees Celsius. And this is really important because you might remember a table that we showed in the previous video that said at 121 degrees Celsius, endospores are inactivated for if you do it for 15 minutes. So, um, and so this is a very common mechanism we use in laboratories. Now, the things that you can put in an autoclave to sterilize, and notice this is pink, so it's sterilizing. Um, the things we put in an autoclave have to be heat resistant. There are certain plastics you can put in the autoclave that are resistant to heat. Um, glass can withstand these temperatures and um, a lot, all the bacteriological media that we make, um, most of that we put in the autoclave. So now when I have little Petri plates, they're plastic. So I have to make the media in the autoclave and then I pour the hot media into the Petri dishes after it's been um, sterilized. So here we have the autoclave is a really common tool that probably almost every microbiology has a need for. Those were our moist heat mechanisms. Here's our dry heat. Um, probably the most common thing that we use in the microbiology lab for microbial control is incineration. And that's, so that's just taking our inoculating loop, putting it in a flame in our Bunsen burner and sterilizing it. And there's nothing that can survive being burned up. So um, incineration is, a, is a, an effective way for microbial control. Um, I have seen examples where, I don't know if it's done as much anymore, but I know it has been done in the past that sometimes um, waste and garbage can be burned up and, um, and decontaminated that way. So incineration, whether it's flaming like we do in the, by putting our inoculating loop in a, in a flame um, or it's burning up the object in itself are effective ways to sterilize. Here's our pink color. I'm going to skip the oven. And um, so that's heat. Heat is great. Um, notice there's a lot of pink with heat, a lot of sterilizing. But when we get to the effects of cold temperature, um, remember cold temperature tends to be bacteria static. And so it's not likely to kill bacteria. It's more likely to just stop the growth. And but that can be really helpful. I mean, we don't need our food to be free of microorganisms. We just don't want any potential pathogens there to grow to a number that can be dangerous. So um, putting things in the refrigerator or the freezer can be a really effective way to slow down microbial growth and um, preserve foods for, for certain periods of time. One of the things you have to be aware of is when you take food out of the refrigerator, oh, like something like um, mayonnaise. Every time that you warm it up, bacteria have a chance to grow a little bit more. And then you put it in the refrigerator and it stops them from growing for a while. It doesn't kill them. It stops them from growing for a while. So you take it out and leave it out again for a couple hours and bacteria can start growing again. So even things that are in the refrigerator can be, be sources of foodborne illness. You just have to be very cautious about how you store them and how long you let them warm up. Now in this, um, in this same section, they talk about desiccation. And I think they do because of the concept of freeze drying. Um, but I have on your handout, let's see, identify the advantages and disadvantages of using desiccation for microbial control and give an example. Um, desiccation, just means drying it out. And so down here, um, vegetative cells exposed directly to normal room air gradually become dehydrated or desiccated. Um, pathogen, some, of the, some pathogens can die after a, only a few hours of air drying. It just depends on the pathogens. Other organisms, endospores, and many other kinds of bacteria don't 
suffer too much from desiccation from from just a little bit of drying out you have to do a substantial amount of drying um, but by removing water from our foods it's a really effective way at um, being bacteria static or um, killing certain microorganisms um, i think they left put it in this section with temperature because um, there's a concept called freeze drying and freeze drying is you freeze something and then you suck the liquid out of it. But these are really effective ways. A desiccation, removing water is a real effective way at um, controlling microbial growth. Think about things like dried fruits. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about osmotic pressure. But um, I think they wanted to mention desiccation here because of the concept of freeze, freeze drying. I'm going to stop right there and take up on radiation in the next video.